It was bound to happen sometime along the way. I guess I forgot some Hallmark holiday. That song is the 9th of May. The band is Vista Hill Band. VistaHillBand.com. Vista Hill. Richard Solomon in the studio with uh, Sherman Karnowitz and Mark Brenner. Let's just get another little taste of their music. This is the 9th of May. All righty. So uh, let's talk a little bit about My Father's Place. Yeah. So, Mark, you, you actually played at the old My Father's Place on Bryan Avenue. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Let's talk about that. It was a great. It was a great venue. Every, everyone played there, um, and I was. I ju- had just joined a kind of a fusion band, jazz fusion band. Um, Gary Vetter was the leader drummer. Um, we had a kick-ass guitar player um, and a great bass player, and it was it was more jazz than rock, and it was you know really really jazz fusion, which was really coming into its own, um, you know, in the mid '70s, and this was toward the latter part of the '70s and '80s. Um, so we played there a few times, had a nice little following. And uh, what, w- what was it like, you know, and, and did you go to show, did you see other people's shows, either during your show or, or before and after? Or? Uh, honestly, I don't think I went to a whole lot of shows there. <laughs> All right. What, 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 what was it like to play there in those days? Was there like a vibe? Was there an energy? Definitely vibe. People came there to listen to the music and they were, you know, they paid attention. It wasn't like they were there to have a meal and a drink and just music was in the background. They were there to listen, which is sometimes a rarity today. Oh, um, I believe that the new My Father's Place you know, is like that. Yeah. People like, are really there to like, listen to all yeah. kinds of music. Not many places on Long Island or the city really that are, that are geared for that, that you're sitting there wanting right. to listen to the music. Well, what's what's kind of cool is you, know, you kind of eat first and then sort of when that's out of the way, then the performers come on. So you've had your nice meal and then I guess then you're full and can pay attention. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I've had a couple of drinks. You know, right? and, and that's really cool. And I'll tell you, I've, se- I've seen a number of shows and it's, the sound is amazing. That's the one thing I could say compared to almost any other venue I've been to, they spent so much time and effort on putting together a world-class, custom-made sound system where no matter where you really sit, the sound is really perfect at every angle. And it's, it's, it's a big enough venue and it's a small enough venue that the sound is just really pristine and in a way that you don't really get, you know, anywhere else. Yeah, and I think I, I think they if they if the sound is anywhere, what it was back then, they did a great job. One of the, one of the most important things, as far as I'm concerned, which is if I'm on the stage and I don't hear myself well or I don't hear good sound coming out in the monitors facing us, it makes it difficult to play well. Or you, you can't play your top, your top level unless. The sound that's, that you're hearing is where where you want it to be, and that's something that they did well then, and I'm sure, I'm sure they're going to be doing it well now. All right. So I guess I'll try to see you guys at the sound check or something like that Absolutely. when you come down there. But I'm telling you, the sound is great. Um, have you actually seen the new venue yet? Not yet. Uh, it's, Pictures it's, of it. It's it's a beautiful venue, and it's very comfortable, and the food is really good. Uh, they, they have a chef that's just world class. So I've had all the food. Um, one of the cool things I got to do. Uh, being affiliated with my father's places, I was there when they did the tasting menus just to uh, to sample the different kinds of foods. And I think they, they tried like three or four different versions of French fries and we all voted on which was the, you know, it was like being on Iron Chef <laughs> and being one of the judges. It was very, very cool. Now I've heard nothing but great things about all, all of it. You know, and you know what? Um, the passion that they have for having great local bands, original music, I think is a real testament to their respect for musicians both locally and for people who actually produce original music because you don't really see a lot of um, original music out out there I mean I'm sure it is but it's not necessarily showcased it's the um, ugly stepchild yeah and you know now let's talk about social media for you guys where, where is your social media and uh, what, what do you have out there obviously it's vistahillband.com is mm-hmm. your website are you on Facebook? Do you do other things to promote the shows? Where's your calendar for other uh, places that you play uh, you know, throughout the year? Why don't you talk about that a little bit? Sure. Uh, Facebook is probably the number one. I mean, we supplement it with other stuff. Um, we also, there's a, um, a website that we joined up and um, professionals listen to it. Um, 
A and R people listen yeah. to it, and so I forget the name of the website. But then they take that music and they apply it to their clients that want. Um, that's how we got "Life Is Good" with the song "Moments," mm -hmm. that they wanted to do a sweepstakes, and they were looking for an upbeat song, and so we um, we put that song up on the website, and uh, it got great reviews, and and they started using it for their summer slogan. So. Um, it's a lot of word of mouth. Like I said, being on Long Island is kind of tough because it's it's just uh, mainly cover bands. So we probably but, but isn't that true? I didn't mean no, but isn't that kind of true almost everywhere? You know, I mean, I've been all kinds of places, upstate, all these other things in Colorado, whatever. And most of what I've seen is like cover bands. You know, you know? it's what the fans. It's, you know, it's just so accessible to them. They they don't want to have to strain their ears listening to something new necessarily. So, but I think we're we're heading down to Nashville in September. Uh, and I know in Nashville, these places, they do encourage. Yeah. So people are there to listen to music. And so that's the primary focus on that. Yeah, Sure, you could eat your French fries or whatever it is while you're doing it, but that's, that's the difference. And it's kind of sad, and I don't want to keep poo-pooing um, Long Island or New York, but you would think New York, you know, this is where we got Billy Joel and we, you know, we, we got all these entertainers that there's really not a venue and a support system for these original uh, music players. Well, one of the things that, at least an observation of mine that, that kind of helped in that decline was the loss of like WLIR. Absolutely. Because, you know, WLIR really showcased and took chances on all kinds of new music and things like that, because um, it was you know Long Island radio. Although they, you know the joke was, what does LIR stand for? It was low income radio. <laughs> 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 in fact, Larry, I think Larry Dunn may have said that in the movie by Ellen Goldfarb. Um, you know, in contrast, uh, when we were in Europe, we we went there with one concert booked in France. Took a rented a car, station wagon, all our, all of our equipment was with us, and we played that one gig all original and the people loved it and from there we got seven other gigs through the next five weeks wow big big ones i mean you know four or five hundred people in a you know in a venue that was a and they they appreciated the it's music a different there. vibe yeah. well yeah it's like it, like i remember reading like the ramones were bigger in europe than they were here yeah you know, they went over there and they were just you know exploded all over the place and he was like yeah 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 whatever you know mm -hmm. <laughs> and it's a shame um you know, one of the things at least that I try to do on this show, amongst the, all the other shows that we do, is we tr really try to like to get the FM debut broadcasts of songs and artists and things like that to really get the word out there. So, I, so I appreciate you guys being here to help in that effort. Our pleasure. So, any great? So you went to Europe. So, give me some great tour stories or you know, great you know things that were. You, I think you told me about a dinner with somebody quite famous. Yes, um, uh, we were on a trip to uh, Paris, France. And a good friend of mine, Jean-Louis Lafont, was a, a DJ on Europe number one, radio DJ. And um, I was staying with him. Mark was at a hotel. And we were going out. And he didn't want to go out. He was a recluse. And so his wife, Bridget, went out. And their daughter, Zoe, and I went out. And we went to this famous restaurant, La Capoule. And we sit down. And um, we actually met, um, who was waiting for us, a record producer. And the record producer said, oh. Eric Clapton's over there. And we looked over there, and there was Eric Clapton, I guess, with his band. And about 10 minutes went by, and the waiter came over and handed jean louis wife, Brigitte, who was quite attractive, a note. And we're all gathering around, and we look at the note, and the note says, if the gentleman to the left of you is your husband or lover, I apologize. Otherwise, I'd love to buy you a drink. Wow. And so 30 seconds later, he comes walking over, and the record producer quickly gets up and kind of pushes Eric Clapton to sit down next to Brigitte. And we sit down, and we're just kind of, hey, I'm having dinner with Eric Clapton, and just looking and just stalking and gazing, you know, what's going on and listening. And quite frankly, he didn't know anyone who was around. His sole purpose there was to focus on Bridget and try to get Bridget to, I guess, come back to his hotel room or whatever. And Eric, if you're listening, I'm sorry, but I had to tell the truth. Well, truth <laughs> is a <the> defense. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, and so he actually had invited us to go to his concert the following day, but we had one of our gigs. Uh, and so we couldn't uh, we Did, couldn't did you up. ask him to, like, join your band? Yeah, come on over to <laughs> us. <laughs> hey, you know. He was a little busy in front of 30,000 people, but... But that was my experience with Eric. We, we had a, um, a fiasco the first night that we played. We were in London at the London Pizza House or something. It was, it was, a, it was a jazz rock venue. 
We got all of our equipment overseas. I got the 220 adapters. We were very green. So, you know, I got a 220 adapter. I went to Radio Shack and got a 220 adapter. Well, we plugged it in. Radio Shack doesn't even exist anymore. Right, exactly. Know, that's, sad, how old, you know? that's how old that is. Um, and we played 15 minutes of the first song. And all of a sudden, one of the amplifiers started to smoke. And another amplifier started to smoke. And before you know it, we burn, burned out all the equipment. So we, we lasted about 25 minutes right. before our equipment was fried. Um, we got the free pizza. Yeah, free pizza was good. Um, <laughs> but we had to buy all new equipment. Was it good as New York pizza? Uh, no, no, nothing's, no, nothing's no. good as New York was pizza. Was there, was there, okay, so, you know, the band Arcade Fire was named after an Arcade Fire and Smoke on the Water was, so was there a song out no, of the, the you know, we, burning circuits or something? We should have done that. It, it's still not too late. It's not too late. It's not I'll, too late. You know, if there's a line or credit, I'll, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Dedicated to you, Rich. There you go. Um, Give me some other great stories from the road, you know. Um, yeah, obviously, Eric Clapton was able to, you know, use his rock star, you know, status to sort of, you know, open some doors. Um, when we were first starting out, um, we, our claim to fame is we played at CBGB's, but that's not the whole truth. We played at CBGB's Cafe, which was right next door to CBGB's. And so um, at that time, we were an eight-piece band, and we were experimenting with a larger band. And we schlepped into the city, and we unloaded all the equipment, and we put everything up in the sound check, and da-da-da. And we look out there, and there is about five people in the audience. And we started playing, uh, which is what you're supposed to do. And three people got up and they started walking. And the two people that were left are kind of looking at each other. And I just stopped and said, please don't leave. Please don't leave. And they ended up staying for a little bit. And, and then they left. But the show must go on. And we just played like it was a rehearsal. And we were in the city. And we had a great time. And we went and got falafel afterwards. And... That's part of being on the road. Oh yes, look, um, look. I, you know, I wrote a book, and I remember you know doing like the book signings, and sometimes the you know the 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 crowds at you know the bookstores were you know a little small, and if you took away the people that I actually asked <laughs> to come, it was even smaller. You know, so yeah, but that's the life of uh, it's, a creative. Uh, it's the life. Yeah, we we regularly play uh, up in Ridgefield, Connecticut, at the Ridgefield Playhouse. And we would open up for the band America whenever they would go up there. And so we had our dressing room and they had their dressing room. And at one point, um, I wanted my girls, who at the time were in their young teens, to kind of come up. And it was important for me to, f to have them see, look at your dad. If I can have a dream and I can do this, I want you to know that it's possible for you to do this. And I just remember the next day being in the car and I'm singing and they're saying, Dad, shut up. Just sh shut up. And I'm thinking to myself, but last night I just opened up for the band America. And they're like, I don't really care. Shut up, okay? <laughs> and that kind of grounds you and kind of keeps reality. Was there? It, it, I remember like the first time I was driving. And I heard myself on the FM, you know, in the car. And I was like, wow, that, you know, it's like really cool. And it was, it was just funny. I just had the station on. And, 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 you know, was there a moment like that where you heard like your music or something like that where you're like, hey, wow, that's just, you know, it's cool. And what is it like to hear yourself not as the performer but as like the listener? What is that like for you? First time I heard it on the radio, they um, mispronounced my last name. So I was just focusing that they said Aronowitz instead of Arnowitz. So that was the first crushing blow. And then the second thing is, wow, that's uh, who, who's not going to have an ego and say, wow, that's really cool. But there's also something to it where you're at a party or something and somebody wants to play and they're doing it as a gesture of respect, I guess. And for me... Okay, I'd rather listen to something else. You know, I'm, we're so much more critical of our music than anybody else. So that's how I feel. I don't know. Yeah, I, I find I find I'm, I'm, when I hear something, when I hear one of our songs, you know, being played somewhere, um, my first thought is you know, we could have done that part better, or maybe it need, needed that. You know, you could, because the fact is, if you're a perfectionist, which which we are, you, you don't you don't you never you're never quite satisfied. I can't get no doo doo. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm sure they have their own problems. <laughs> at, at what point do you listen to music and say it's good enough versus it needs to be better? 
I think it's at some point if after you've reworked a song for you know for a month and it sounds good you kind of have you have to take a step back and say okay I, th- I think it's there you know yeah we could change this change that but you may come back full circle and realize that the first thing that you did was the best right that's true you know uh, it, it's funny the for people who don't write music you know you don't appreciate the struggle of the process just as you know people who write you know books and articles and you know other things of you know websites whatever it is that you create um, you know, we kind of take it for granted as consumers that all this stuff is there. You know, you look, you turn on the radio and it's endless content. You put on the TV, there's endless content. You put on the web, there's <laughs> endless content. I mean, you know, the web is just, you know, infinite. But but there was all of these people out there who started with zero, you know, blank paper, blank computer screens, blank tape, blank pictures. And then somehow through a tremendous creative struggle, all this stuff is created, but yet, no, you, when you're on the receiving end of it, it's so, like you go know, to the supermarket, there's all this stuff, but there were farmers and, you know, and, and truck drivers and everything in the between that actually, and marketing people and everybody who actually, and cows, and, you know, chickens and all of it, that actually made it all happen, you know, and we don't really appreciate it that. It takes a village, it really does. Yeah, and yeah. and it's, it goes from just one little seed of an idea from an emotion, and it just starts blossoming and blossoming and blossoming, and hopefully you want it to continue. And that's why we love doing originals, because you can get that instant feedback when you start performing. When I'm up there and I'm performing and I'm singing, playing guitar, the first thing I'm doing is I'm looking at people's feet. Because if I look at their feet and they're tapping, I know I've got something there. Oh, that's cool. That's great. That's a great insight. Lights lights are in your eyes, and so you look down, and all you really can see is, for me, focusing on the feet and see what's going on. All right, so we have like a minute. So what should I play um, as our bumper song here? Uh, What do you like? Um, Why don't you put I Know a Girl? Uh, It's a song that I wrote uh, that I wanted to be a romantic song. And what happened is when I presented it to the band, somehow it came out. I Know a Girl, you've got the wrong one on. Yeah, I think you've got Promen on. Yeah. Okay. Well, It came out as a uh, reggae type of song like this. So this is Richard Solomon, Taking Care of Business. My father's plays radio. You listen to this little musical interlude before we go to a break. I know a girl who can touch her tongue to her nose, take a pen of paper, then write beautiful prose. Throws her own garden, works out every day, and she gives me love in her own. All right, we'll be right back. 